For Easter week, we are exploring extraterrestrial life through science and science fiction with Julie Novakova, Giovanni Poggiano, and Eric Choi. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. Now for Easter week, as most people share fables of giant anthropomorphic rabbits distributing chocolate eggs, we are exploring extraterrestrial life through science and science fiction. Now, later on the show, we're going to be welcoming uh, Julie Novakova, Giovanni Pagali, and Eric Choi to the show, talking about their new anthology, Life Beyond Us. Okay, now the idea of, li of alien life has fascinated us for centuries. Why not, right? Now, while sci-fi has often portrayed extraterrestrial beings as having advanced intelligence, strange abilities, and or a thirst for human flesh appetite, the scientific reality is likely somewhat different. Let's buckle up and take a journey through the fictional and scientific world of extraterrestrial life, shall we? In science fiction, uh, aliens come in all shapes and sizes, from little green men to Mars to the greys, alpha draconians and everything in between. <laughs> These fantastic stories often involve intrepid explorers traveling through space, boldly going where no one has gone before, battling aliens and uncovering hidden mysteries along the way. The search for extraterrestrial life in our own time and reality, if that's what you want to call this. Sure, reality, whatever. Typically involves telescopes on Earth as well as in space. James Webb Telescope, I'm looking in your direction! Specialized instruments scan the skies, looking for telltale signs of life on other worlds, such as the presence of methane, oxygen, or other known chemical markers of organic biology. Uh, life sprung up on Earth soon after our nascent planet formed about four and a half billion years ago. Yay! However, the first multicellular life did not make an appearance until just about 600 million years ago. Aww. And paninis, cappuccinos, and radio telescopes came far later. Hmm, paninis. Such microbial life might exist in a variety of places in our own solar system, such as the icy moons of Jupiter or Saturn, or under the ruddy surface of Mars. Now, if life on other worlds follows a similar path to our own, with microbes being the sole form of life on planets for billions of years, that could mean that exoplanets might be thriving with tiny microbial life for eons without having life forms we might recognize as intelligent. On many, perhaps most worlds, life may have evolved in environments unimaginably different than our own. Beings living on distant exoplanets and moons may be unrecognizable to humans, limited by our collective knowledge, amassed over just a few short millennia, living on a tiny world orbiting a modest star. Next up, we're going to have our first ever triple interview with three of the creators of the new science slash sci-fi anthology, Life Beyond Us. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are excited to have Three guests on for the first time, 
and they're talking about an awesome new anthology that's just uh, has just come out called Life Beyond Us. <laughs> this book combines science fiction with science fact, and there it is. Um, to help break down barriers to great science education. We are joined by Julie Novakova. She is a science fiction writer and an evolutionary biologist. Giovanni Pagali, planetary scientist and astrobiologist who's worked on Osiris Rex and the Perseverance missions. And Eric Choi, an aerospace engineer who has the honor, distinct honor of having the first story in this book. So welcome to the show, all of you. Thank you, James. Thank you for having us, James. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So first, I want to start with you, Julie. Can you tell us a little bit about this book and how you developed the idea of having an anthology combining science and science fiction? Of course, I mean, ever since uh, I was a little child, I loved both science and reading science fiction. And eventually I embarked on both careers, uh, venturing into evolutionary biology and doing science, science outreach in astrobiology and planetary science. And at the same time, writing, translating and editing science fiction. And when I started uh, co-leading the outreach group of the European Astrobiology Institute, I uh, basically uh, tried to realize uh, my dream for some years to create an anthology that would merge these worlds of science fiction, which is full of ideas and imagination and can inspire future scientists and engineers, and of science, which uh, is more rigorous, which relies on the scientific method, but uh, requires uh, an equal amount of imagination and hard work and dedication. And it can also, uh, when it gets to the general public, inspire them to take more interest. So uh, basically science fiction uh, can be thought of as the way to reach a wider audience, to really get to the general public and to uh, make people more interested in the amazing world of science. And astrobiology, of course, uh, is a quite popular field in this respect because it asks the uh, timeless question of whether we are alone, but it's just one small part of the field. Uh, so eventually, together with my co-editors at Laxa Media, Lucas Kalo and Susan Forrest, we edited this amazing book, which has 27 science fiction stories by leading authors, among whom is Eric here, and 27 essays uh, by experts on the topics that are present in the stories, which can be planetary protection, like in the case of Eric and Giovanni, but also the possibility of life on Titan, or the issue of robotic versus crude exploration, mm -hmm. exotic life, Life, life in other solvents than water, uh, and uh, the possibility of encountering a non-human intelligence and so on. So for me, it's a dream come true, and I definitely hope that it manages to not just entertain, but also inspire lots of people. And this is something that science fiction has been doing ever since uh, the modern part of the genre was started, because writers like H.G. Wells, uh, more than a hundred years ago, uh, wrote not just science fiction stories, but also popular science articles that tackled the open questions, such as uh, what would we encounter on Mars if it has life? And that's also a topic that's relevant to Eric's story and Giovanni's essay. Right, well, that's wonderful. And that's what we're gonna hit on next. Let's start with you, Eric. Now, your story, Hemlock on Mars, kicks this whole thing off. Can you give us a brief intro to the story and what does it mean to you? Well, I perhaps can start with the beginning and how the story came about. So as you said, 
my background is in aerospace engineering. And one of the missions that I was privileged to work on a number of years ago was a Mars lander called Phoenix, mm. for which Canada provided the meteorology instrumentation package for the lander. And I had the privilege to work on the industrial side on the engineering, systems engineering uh, aspects of, of that particular payload. So I had come across a paper that was written several years after the mission had in fact completed where a team had done a bio essay assay rather of the clean room in which the phoenix lander had undergone assembly integration and test prior to its mission so as you've probably seen on television and, and other places spacecraft are typically assembled in these clean facilities uh, for, for a number of reasons. You want to protect the electronics, but in the case of Mars missions and other missions to astrobiologically sensitive areas in the solar system, there's an added requirement for planetary protection, which uh, I'm sure Giovanni will talk about mm -hmm. a little bit later, that you want to minimize the risk that you're bringing microbes or other things into space with you and then depositing them inadvertently on on other planets and what was interesting about this paper was that this particular team had discovered a effectively a new microorganism not an alien organism but a microbe a terrestrial microbe that because of the clean room conditions was actually driving evolution of this microbe towards oh. it being hardy to things like common disinfectants and it, it, in fact it was found to even be metabolizing some of the cleaning agents that they were actually <laughs> using on this mission which is uh, which was ironic and i thought it was absolutely fascinating and when the opportunity to write a story for this anthology came about you know th th thanks to th thanks to julie um this paper came to mind now the timing was interesting as well because this this project began right around the start of the pandemic mm. and so when i was you know i was discussing this paper with julie I, I i'm not very good at these things sometimes and i said well you know julie this is an interesting idea but the only thing that comes to my mind is sort of the andromeda thing Andromeda strain thing where, you know, somehow this microbe gets out and causes chaos in the wider world, which was probably not the best thing to write about because obviously it <laughs> was happening and is continue to happen in the real world. And this is really not the most interesting or creative story. And then Julie, bless her, being the the amazing editor and creative person and biologist that she is, actually, and this is something that you know every writer dreams of, is basically she handed me the story idea on a silver platter and said, Eric, well, why don't you do a story where they actually discover that this hardy microorganism has actually hitched a ride unbeknownst to them on a spacecraft that is already on its way to Mars. And my goodness, what are we going to do about it now? So a long way of saying that that is the uh, the background and the premise to my story, um, thanks to Julie. That's great. I'm just picturing this little tardigrade of a microbe just fending off all attacks, you know? <laughs> so... Uh... So Giovanni, finally, we talked about planetary, um, you know, planetary science and defending, you know, keeping Earth safe from alien life forms and keeping, uh, you know, biologically sensitive areas in space safe from yeah, yeah. our life forms. How much trouble are we in? <laughs> uh, let's say it's not easy for sure. <laughs> also because it's something very new actually is uh, let's say that planetary protection the the uh, sensibility of people and like scientists about planetary protection is growing up uh, with the space exploration so actually is as you say is like to protect earth from the possibility that something alive is on the planet that we are exploring and this is like super um essential when we are bringing back sample 
uh, on on Earth. So like all the space, all the sample retard mission, either from NASA, like Osiris Rex, the planet uh, Mars 2020, or the Japanese space mission, either for the, from the moon, are missions that are possibly bringing back something on Earth. They are bringing mostly rocks, but we have to be sure that there is only rocks on that sample and not something that in not, not not have to be like the bad alien of the sci-fi movie that comes to conquer Earth, but just having the mixing of something that the evolutionary uh, pathway was taking the divide is a dangerous. And as I say in the very first line of my essay, it happens on Earth, actually. It happens on Earth when during the exploration of other continent, we were trying to, we were start to mix like animals that were like growing up and uh, evolving, evolving in uh, some particular environment, and they were like mm. moved artificially in other environment, and a lot of problems started in that case. So having that experience in our mind, we started to think about okay, we have to be sure that we don't um, we don't have and we don't uh, pr produce uh, a danger for her, of course. On the other side, there is also a, a very scientific point of view in planetary protection of the other worlds, because we have to be sure that we are not contaminating Earth with something that's extraterrestrial, but we have to be maybe 100% more sure that we are not contaminating the other planets for two particular reasons. The first one is like a microbes that arrive on Mars, for example, can find the condition to um to grow up and to evolve and to colonize that particular part of mars so we don't want to alterate what we are going to explore because if we are going to explore to increase our knowledge of the planet we really don't want to to um, like uh, alterate the surface that we are exploring on the other side and this is particularly important for astrobiological mission if we are going in another planet on another surface to find life, we have to be sure that the life that we do, we found eventually is not the life of Earth. We right. want to be sure that is a, a, a real biomarker, is really some organic material that is originated on the planet, for example, on Mars. So if we are not cleaning very well our instrument, this can lead to a misunderstanding and misinterpretation of the result that we are having. So for this reason, uh, now it's uh, well defined in uh, international level. Every mission, depending on the target of the exploration, have to be have to follow some rules, some very let's say strict in sometimes rules, depending on which environment we are going to explore. Of course, the dry surface of an asteroid is for sure less astrobiologically important than some very uh, promising part of Mars in which maybe can be that life is still active if there was life on Mars, of course. This is like the, the basic uh, hypothesis. But um, so there is like, uh, there were in the, in the past uh, uh, a lot of work at the international level that is kind of parallel to science. So science was like um, exploring and was pushing to explore all this planet. And on international level, like uh, the space agencies um, started to create a uh, kind of handbook of the good explorer in order to preserve Earth on one side and all the planets that we want to explore on the other side. Hmm. And Joe, it, it seems like throughout the history of science fiction, you know, there always have been two camps. The more science literate science fiction that probably started off with Byrne and goes up through Star Trek these days, and the more moralistic tales of H.G. Wells uh, through Star Wars. And did you find, and, well, first, I don't know if you agree with that, but did you find that there was one type of story that you were more drawn towards uh, for putting into this anthology? Or do you think it was, or do you think there's something to be gained from both sides of both types of science fiction? I think that both kinds of SF, as you define them, uh, have something to offer uh, 
for the reader who is interested in science and for the reader who might uh, find that interest in the future. Uh, and uh, we ask the authors to write stories that are related to astrobiology topics, but uh, the stories didn't necessarily have to be hard science fiction as the subgenre defined by uh, being more rigorous and realistic in terms of science. Uh, most of the stories uh, adhere to science uh, as we uh, understand it today quite closely and they are quite realistic, but there are some stories that take the astrobiology topic uh, more metaphorically and uh, go to explore uh, some exciting philosophical questions that might still come up in space exploration and uh, in doing science, uh, particularly in the field of astrobiology, because uh, for me, uh, I think it's important to uh, understand science fiction as a kind of sandbox where we can play with different uh, visions of the future or even alternate past and see what happens uh, when something changes, when something is different. It can be some new scientific discovery. It it can be some new technology or new social movement. And we can see the impacts on society and individual people. And we can imagine what we would do in such a case. And uh, we can use Eric's story as an example because uh, it's one of the very realistic stories. And it's something that actually could happen basically this day if uh, there were an astrobiology mission en route to Mars. It's uh, very possible that we would discover some uh, hardy microbe uh, in that clean room where it was assembled. And we would be faced with the question of whether we should allow the mission to reach Mars and potentially contaminate it, even though the risk as assessed by many studies quickly conducted on Earth is not deemed to be quite high, uh, or we should terminate the mission which uh, had so much work and money poured into it and which could promise us really fantastic results. So it's, a, uh, in, in, it's an impossible dilemma because we will never know which uh, answer is the right one. There are so many unknowns, so many possibilities. Uh, and so... Uh, it's a dilemma that we can face from the scientific point of view, as well as the personal point of view of the people involved in the mission. And Eric uh, did a wonderful job bringing both of these about and introducing them to the reader. And so uh, I think that's quite thrilling. And other stories, uh, if we uh, include, let's say, the Let's hard as have more metaphorical examples. Uh, imagine, for instance, uh, what would happen if some other civilization had the power to move people from Earth to uh, another planet and to create a basically ideal environment for us and to uh, promote the positive parts of culture and to... Uh, make uh, reality the de extinction of people uh, of uh, species that uh, were extinct uh, during recent history so if they had all this power uh, is it responsible uh, for them to just take some people and relocate them and uh, make the de extinction plans and uh, not actually try to improve environment right here on Earth? Is it uh, good because they are leaving us, uh, the, let's say, possibility of free choice, free will, and uh, they're letting us continue our development uninterrupted? It's basically like the prime directive in Star Trek. Right, right. Or, or is it irresponsible because they... Uh, could improve the lives of billions of people and animals and all life on Earth so immensely, and they're not doing it. So again, this is a dilemma uh, where neither of the answers is uh, can be deemed uh, 
basically the right one. I mean, both points of view have something in them and it's a dilemma that we can face in the future in a different uh, way when uh, we actually try to uh, make some extinct animals uh, extant again, uh, which is something that has been talked about for quite some time. And uh, we have to be prepared for, for both the scientific questions, the practical ones, and the ethical and social ones. So science fiction is really great at imagining these kinds of potential futures and preparing us for them. Hmm. I, I, I have to say that I would not mind seeing a dodo in real life. <laughs> I think the pictures are just adorable. <laughs> <laughs> Dodos for de-extinction. <laughs> and Eric, we're starting to go in, you know, we've had people in space permanently for over 20 years now. We're starting to go back to the moon. Mars may not be far, be far in the future. Um, do you think as an aerospace engineer that we have the technology now to keep both Earth, Mars, and the Moon protected? Or are we going to need to develop radically new technologies to make that happen? Well, that is a very, very interesting question. And it's because when you talk about engineering and the technologies that would be required for these types of journeys, there are so many things you need. So in the case of the things that I am most familiar with, which is sort of the, the nuts and bolts types of things of the actual spacecraft and the propulsion, then, then yes, of course, we have been sending things to places like the moon and the Mars for, for, for decades, um, you know, brought to you, as they say, by, you know, Newton's laws of motion and, and classical mechanics. These things are relatively straightforward. I would argue that the big challenges of permanent human presence in space are the things that I am frankly much less familiar with. And these are things like the biological aspects. How do you keep people healthy and alive? How do we have truly closed loop life support systems? And as you say, James, once we're there, how do we balance exploration with actually contaminating the very thing that we're trying to explore? And this is particularly challenging for a place like Mars because, frankly, we as human beings are just walking and talking bags of microbes. <laughs> and it is really not practical to subject a human being to some of the planetary protection techniques like throwing them in dry heat microbial reduction at 150 <laughs> degrees Celsius for 45 minutes or throwing them into a bath of alcohol for uh, for, for sterilization. And so I, I think all of these questions, you know, still need to be answered. And it's it's going to be answered by people with, I think, you know, different expertise than, than I have. Mm. And finally, I'm going to finish with you, Giovanni. Uh, if you had to take your best guess, your best estimate, where are we going to find good evidence for alien life first? Well, that's a really you know, important question. Um, if I have to speak about my personal feeling, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, I think Mars for now is the best option that we have for some, let's say, evolutionary reason of the planet. The planet is really close to Earth. It's really similar in a lot of aspects to our planet. Uh, we know now that in the past of Mars, the surface was really similar to what we can observe nowadays on Earth. There are still uh, some places on Earth that are really similar to Mars. So actually, the only uh, we know that in the past, Mars was hosting mm, uh, liquid li uh, liquid water on the surface. We see the 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 remnant of these 
presence of water, we see clays, that is a mineral that we know uh, can form uh, just in presence of liquid water. Uh, we see, for example, is the case of perseverance, uh, the ancient delta of a river that was like just flowing inside a crater. So, uh, of course, Mars was is not like um, the planet in which you can evolve, uh, it can, you can have a, an evolved life like on Earth, because the stability of the planet was probably really, really short in the history of the solar system. So in a short time, you cannot evolve the form of life. But for sure, our like best guess of try of finding uh, at least the proof of a, a past life is Mars. Second place for the icy moons of the of the other part of the solar system. But in that case, we have the 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 best ingredient. We have water, liquid water, a lot of liquid water. But there are still some some parameters that are uh, a little bit uh, not in the in the good uh, in the good uh, value to have uh, uh, easy to have easily uh, um, some life form there. So. My opinion, so probably probably all the scientists working on icy moon will not agree with me, but uh, my opinion is that uh, for now Mars is our in the solar system is our like best option to find uh, at least the proof of past life, if not the like the presence of life that was surviving. Because just to conclude, this is something that we know that uh, complex life like like man or animals are quite easy to like not survive to catastrophe and climate change. But we know that there are a lot of uh, living beings on Earth, like uh, extremophile or bacteria, that are really, really good in adapting new condition of life. So who knows? Maybe in some small parts of Mars, there are still some Martian bacteria that survived from the period, let's say, the good period of Mars up to now. So we need to explore more, actually. <laughs> yeah, and um, I definitely hope that the book is going to exp uh, inspire future explorers because there are so many things we don't know. We have no idea whether Mars nowadays has, for instance, active hydrothermal systems in the subsurface, which could be great places to host oases of life or whether uh, the potential lakes buried deep beneath the South Polar Cap uh, are actually water and how salty is it? Could it potentially host some extremophile life or not? And as to the icy moons, uh, we know so little. I mean, about Enceladus, we know quite a lot from the geysers, but we still don't know the age of the small moon. And we have no idea how much... Uh, power is there within uh, the core that would power life, how many geochemical gradients. And there's so much to explore still within our own solar system because we know so little about it. And if there's one thing I'd love people to realize more is that basically around every corner, even here on Earth, uh, there are still so many open questions so many unknown things to probe to discover so much uh, extremophile life or life that can be cultivated in petri dishes that needs to be discovered and explored and in the solar system we've barely scratched the surface and in some cases there is no definable surface at all to scratch so yeah and uh we really need to send more planetary science missions and astrobiology missions. So hopefully some of these 27 stories and essays are going to plant this idea in the mind of some future policymaker or just a fan of science, of space, that uh, we need to go further when no one has gone and explored before. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much for being on the show. It was fabulous talking with each of you. Thank you, James, for having us. Yeah. Thank you, James. And yeah, thank uh, you, James. that was uh, Julie Novakova, Giovanni Pagali, and 
Eric Choi, who are working together on their fabulous new book that just came out, Life Beyond Us. Check it out wherever you get your awesome science books. Now, if life on another planet were to develop a technological civilization comparable to our own, it is very possible, but by no means certain, that they would stumble across radio transmissions, which might be seen from Earth. But radio works so well for communication here on our home planet, in part because radio waves can bounce off the ionosphere of the upper atmosphere, and be received by a listener at a far greater distance than would be possible with only a direct line of sight signal. Other worlds are likely to have different physical and chemical characteristics shaping technologies of alien civilizations, and with it the artificial signals their planets emit. Still, large, full-sky surveys recording radio emissions over vast swaths of sky night after night are already building gargantuan databases of observations. Once examined by cutting-edge artificial intelligence, these instruments could soon reveal intriguing signals from amongst the stars. Could intelligent life on other worlds be dangerous? Why? Thanks for asking! Now, from the Earth versus the flying saucers to Mars attacks and beyond, we've seen countless examples of extraterrestrial life that seeks to destroy humanity. They come to Earth to conquer and dominate using their advanced technology and or superior physical abilities to wipe out humanity. Any civilization capable of bringing beings or even drone weapons to Earth is by definition, far more advanced than us as far as technology goes. So, basically, if you are thinking humans could put up any kind of real defense against any hostile aliens which did arrive, well, I have some bad news for you. It would even be a contest. Besides, do you think we could do much worse of a job running this place than you have already? But, this would also mean that they have survived for a long time with the ability to wipe themselves out and haven't done it. If they survived the double-edged sword of technology, they have almost certainly moved beyond the need for war and conquest, making it unlikely they would engage in the kind of violence we see in so much sci-fi. He's right. Who knows what amazing discoveries we'll make in the future. Maybe giant anthropomorphic (laughs) rabbits distributing chocolate (laughs) eggs. Happy Easter. Next week on the Cosmic Companion, we kick off a two-week celebration of Earth Day. So the Cosmic Companion has asked me, Gaia, Mother of Earth, to make the announcement. On the 15th of April, we will be talking about how children can rescue the planet. We're going to be joined by Cliff Lewis, author of We the Future. Then on the 22nd Earth Day itself, we will dive into the importance of one of our most vital resources, water. We will be joined by Sandra Postel, director of the Global Water Policy Project. Make sure to join us both weeks. I'm serious. I'm basically Mother Nature. It's not nice to stand up Mother Nature. There are more episodes of The Cosmic Companion at thecosmiccompanion.com and .net. Like, lots of them. They're like eggs in an Easter basket, I tells ya. If you like this show, comment, subscribe and share. You want the number of subscribers to multiply, don't you? Go on, then. Hop to it. Until then, clear skies.